I guess if you, yeah, got it. Um, I guess a, a couple caveats. So first of all, can everybody hear me? Okay, my coming through. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I am relying on the Wi-Fi at my hotel, if for some reason I blip out, please trust that I will troubleshoot and get back into the meeting as quickly as possible. I have a, a backup plan with a hotspot on my phone. Uh, and the other thing I'll say, if you see me looking down, um, I'm not trying to be antisocial. It's just, I've got my text down here below. Uh, so I might be looking down occasionally, but what I'm going to do is share my screen because I do have a PowerPoint here. So let me get that up on the screen. You should all see that. Um, and start it from the beginning so folks can see the, the PowerPoint. We good to go? Okay, great. Um, okay, so I want to start, first of all, by saying thank you to, to Jeff and all of you at the Duluth Audubon Society for giving me this opportunity uh, to share some time with you. It's much appreciated. Um, and I'm really excited to be here as I, as I was telling Jeff and Eric before the meeting, Great Gray, I, I, if I had to say what my nemesis bird is, it would be the great gray owl. I think I've invested a couple hundred hours uh, in, in Canada and in Montana and Wyoming and all over the place looking for great grays. So I'm really uh, looking forward to trying for one on this trip. So I suppose I should give you quickly just a little background on, on who I am in, in addition to what Jeff said, uh, so that this talk doesn't feel quite so Kind of random. Uh, so as you as you know from what Jeff just said, I'm an English professor at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. Uh, I was born in northeastern Ohio, and I attended undergrad at Miami University in southern Ohio, not Florida, uh, and then did my graduate work at NYU and UCLA, focusing on British Romantic poets. So think Wordsworth, Keats, Byron, those guys. Uh, and that is still my main scholarly focus. I got tenure on the basis of a 2013 book on romantic period women writers. Uh, and romanticism is what I tend to teach the most at the uh, at the Naval Academy. Uh, and I know that might be kind of an unlikely image. If you think of the Naval Academy, thinking of a bunch of you know military, future military officers uh, studying Keats, but trust me, it does happen. Uh, that's my son making a cameo appearance in this photograph as well. Uh, so in addition to all of that literary stuff, I'm also a birder, uh, a member of the Audubon Society, uh, and an outdoorsman, and that has begun to kind of creep into my professional life. So I've, I've written quite a bit for mainstream publication on issues involving uh, involving wildlife, environmentalism, national parks, um, especially birds uh, in the Baltimore Sun, in the Chicago Tribune, in the Denver Post, and, and in the New York Times, specifically on owls um, a few years ago. And for the past several months, I've been working on compiling materials for a scholarly publication on hummingbirds, and that's the basis for tonight's presentation. And the article is due out, I'm happy to say, sometime in the next few months. Uh, so I'll, I'll share that information with Jeff when it when it comes out if you're if you're interested. Uh, and by the way, if you were looking for a good drinking game taking a shot of whiskey every time I say hummingbird tonight that would definitely do the trick. I'm sorry there really is no good synonym for hummingbird. I've, I've tried. I can only say tiny bird so many times. Uh, so maybe before I go any further, I'm kind of curious to hear from from all of you just at the outset, uh, if you have any good hummingbird stories or any associations, I'm always kind of interested to know if anybody's had a special hummingbird experience, you know, having one fly right up into your face, maybe, or, or drink out of one of those little ring feeders, if you've ever used one of those. Does anybody have a hummingbird experience? I do, while working way out in the woods in the field and just having a a blaze orange cruiser vest on uh -huh. having a, a poor hummingbird approach me early early in the spring before anything was blooming or anything and i thought oh you poor little bugger i hope you find some maple sap but <laughs> thinking that i should wear one of those hat hummingbird feeders from now yeah. on you were the strangest flower that hummingbird had ever seen <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. i also have a story we had a hummingbird nest right off our back deck and uh, the, the, the bird fledged August 31st, and it was uh, a record for Minnesota, for this area, a record late 
fledgling. <laughs> Incredible. Amazing nests too, right? I mean, so impossibly tiny. They're, they're really hard to find. Yeah. Beautiful. Made with lichen. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had one this last spring. I think it was this last spring. And, and I had always read or heard how um, hummingbirds will follow sapsuckers up and they will find a tree where sapsuckers have done in the early spring when there's no leaves yet on the trees and they will drink this or eat the insects out of the sap that's clustered in there. And I was always skeptical of that. And then one day I was out walking the dog, still snow out. And there it was right before me. I locked down the sapsucker. I saw it. And then I saw the hummingbird drinking out of the little holes in that that sapsucker had made. And I was like, wow, it really is true. It was really cool to see in, in action. Yeah, amazing symbiotic thing going yep. on there. Yeah. Well, okay, I'll 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 move ahead, but I mean, I think I, I, I just want to. Could yeah. I just add one other note, uh, Greg Garmer? I, I I still found my note from the one I when uh, I saw with uh, uh, a Rufus hummingbird uh, in Duluth on November twenty fifth. Uh, of 2004. Anyway, I just, uh, and that was in Laura Bear Erickson's backyard with Charlie Match, who is no longer alive. Anyway, it was just, uh, that was really late Rufus Hummingbird that was at her feeder. Interesting. Yeah, you know, in, in Maryland, of course, on the East Coast, we only have ruby throat hummingbirds. That's the only species that we, that we usually see. Um, so it's sort of improbable that I would get so interested in them, maybe. Although I did go to UCLA, and of course in California we had we had several species. Um, so I, I wanted to address why hummingbirds, you know, why this particular topic. Uh, and I think you know, based on what folks just said, I mean, one one thing not to miss is that I I think hummingbirds you rarely have a neutral experience with a hummingbird. I think they always make an impression. Uh, but let me hasten to say I'm not an ornithologist. I've certainly learned a lot about <clears throat> biology and the natural history of hummingbirds in the process of researching this project. But if you have any scientific questions about hummingbirds, I'm not the person to ask. I mean, I suspect there may be people in this virtual room right now who would, who would be far better equipped than I uh, to answer questions about the birds themselves. Uh, indeed, my interest in hummingbirds is really more closely aligned with my professional training. So I, I'm working on cultural history. And I suppose in this context, by cultural history, I mean um, less biological and the more kind of anthropological uh, interest in hummingbirds. So I mean to answer a pretty basic question here. What have people thought about hummingbirds and how have they represented hummingbirds over the years? So put another way, how do hummingbirds matter to people? So that's that's the basic question. Um, and and one thing that may feature in the, the article that I'm finishing up now, but won't in tonight's talk, is how ornithologists and early bird catalogers depicted hummingbirds in their work. So people like John Gould, for example, um, whose mid 19th century illustrated book on hummingbirds is a glory to behold if you've never seen it. If you can track down a, a digital copy, uh, it's really worth checking out. But I'm gonna set that discussion aside. Um, so this project that I'm, I'm working on has some geographical limits built into it. So although we do find hummingbirds represented, for example, in Asian artwork uh, and derivatively in European artwork, as I'm guessing you all know, naturally speaking, hummingbirds are, at least for the last many millions of years, exclusively New World species. Um, so my focus is bound to be mainly South, Central, and North America. That's still a lot of land with a lot of human history. So at the moment, I'm, I'm reaching back to the Maya and up to more or less the present day. Uh, even so, as you'll hear toward the end of tonight's presentation, I'm finding myself drawn to Europe as well for kind of grim reasons that I'll get to near the end, which is all to say I'm attempting something impossible here because <laughs> I can't hope to cover everything. And I know that I'm bound to oversimplify some of what I do say. So I'll apologize for that in advance. Uh, but again, why hummingbirds? Um, it's it's kind of a long story, but the more I've read into the mythologies and the pop cultural works that describe hummingbirds, the more I've come to appreciate just kind of how unsettled uh, and unsettling 
they are in our historical consciousness. Um, so I'll illustrate, this is um, obviously an old map of the new world. Um, I'll illustrate this by asking for um, a show of hands and maybe we'll do just virtual hands or, or you can even just kind of speak up. Um, if I forced you to take a position on whether the hummingbird is a masculine or a feminine symbol, masculine or feminine, which would you pick for the humming word? And, and one way to approach this is whether you think, let's say a man or a woman would be more likely to get a hummingbird tattoo uh, or wear a t-shirt with a hummingbird on it. Uh, maybe the way to do this is how many of you would say feminine? If you, if you guys know how to, is there a way to raise your hands with the, yeah. There we go. The, the votes are coming in. Yeah, it's looking like a pretty solid show of hands for, for feminine. And that's what I would have said. Um, that was my presumption. And indeed, a, a quick and dirty search of Amazon.com for hummingbird uh, shirt does indeed show a feminine bias. This was a very unscientific survey, but I came up with about 150% uh, in a feminine bias of 150%. So likewise, you can do a Google image search for hummingbird tattoo and the returns are not exclusively, but they are overwhelmingly, almost exclusively, images of women. And I had a fun time explaining that internet search to my wife when she walked into the room. Uh, so one of the light bulb moments for me was learning that in Aztec culture, the hummingbird was a masculine signifier. And not just that, it was the masculine signifier, you could say. It was the emblem of their chief warrior deity and associated with ritual blood sacrifice. I'll, I'll come back to that. And it's been one discovery like another, uh, one discovery after another, kind of like that. Uh, and what I'm going to do tonight is just share a handful of the highlights, some of the greatest hits of hummingbird representation. And for each of the examples I plan to share, let me tell you, there are dozens that I won't have time for. I couldn't even fit them all into the article. But I want to give you at least a sense of how varied the hummingbird's reception has been over time. Uh, and this might be the moment to forewarn, because while much of the mythology and symbolism I'm going to share tonight will be purely delightful, uh, as I alluded to a moment ago with the reference to human sacrifice, uh, the hummingbird's history also has a few dark corners. I won't be showing any really graphic imagery or anything, but I will be briefly describing some pretty violent rituals. And disturbing as it is, this history also takes us briefly through Nazi Germany. But first things first, before we get into representation, we ought to try to consider the characteristics of the real world hummingbird, the trochility, that seem to have fascinated people for these past four millennia and generated the representations that I'll be sharing. So for one thing, the way that they move, which is to say more freely than any other bird, forward, backward, up and down, hovering, migrating across vast distances. They are the very embodiment of agility. And this agility is something that not only aids in their feeding behavior and in their territorial defense, uh, but also in their courtship, which early observers probably mistook for territorial defense as well. Um, indeed, their violent or seemingly violent interactions are a big part of their representational history. Um, and that may surprise you, although maybe not if you've ever had a hummingbird fly right up to your face. Um, of course, you can't not comment on their size being generally quite small, and in many cases near the very extreme of smallness for vertebrates. Um, the bee hummingbird, as you probably know, is the world's smallest warm-blooded vertebrate. Uh, their colors, not least the iridescence of their feathering, which is really a kind of optical illusion. Um, in some cases, especially the bright coloring of their neck area called their gorget, the sounds that they make, um, especially that of their wings humming or buzzing, but also their chattering calls. Um, sometimes their general silence or lack of a beautiful song gets commented on by uh, writers throughout history. Um, their approachability, if you've ever had that experience of feeding a hummingbird from a ring feeder or of having one buzz right up to your face, you know what I'm talking about. For such tiny creatures, they can be apparently quite fearless. And finally, of course, the shape of their bills, adapted for accessing hard to reach nectar, 
uh, but also associated in legend with swords or spears or even needles, which I'll, I'll comment on as well. So these are, there's a lot more than this, obviously, but I would say this is a pretty good working list of characteristics to explain why hummingbirds have appeared culturally uh, as often and in as varied uh, ways as they have. Okay, so kind of a grand tour through the, the highlights here, and I'll start with the Maya. So for the Maya, we're reaching back about 2000 BCE here, uh, Mesoamerican civilization that inhabited some or all of what is now Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and El Salvador. And the hummingbird had a few different symbolic histories and origins there. The image that you see here is from a Mayan vase with an anthropomorphic hummingbird facing an enthroned ruler. And in one iteration, this is the simplest one, no doubt based on the hummingbird's exquisite and iridescent colors, the bird is the sun, the sun in disguise, trying to woo the moon, which is characterized by a beautiful woman. Um, another version of the Mayan hummingbird story, though, has to do with its bill shape, and it explains that the, hummingbird, the hummingbirds pierced the tongues of ancient kings. And when the king's blood was poured onto sacred scrolls and then burned, the Maya's divine ancestors would appear in the smoke to commune with them. And the Mayan, as you may know, they worshiped ancestors who would act as their emissaries to the gods. So hummingbirds were part of, of that process. But maybe the most compelling one uh, and the most intricate of all the Mayan hummingbird stories has to do with the bird's own creation. So the Mayan word for hummingbird, which you can see phoneticized at the top of the screen, uh, is zenuum. And we think that was what we call onomatopoeia, like a name based on the sound of the bird's wings buzzing. That's where we think zenuum came from. And so the story goes, the gods had created all things, all beings on earth, including all the birds. But then they noticed two problems. One, there was no one in charge of carrying their desires and carrying their thoughts from one place to another. So they needed little messengers. And two, they had all these leftover materials. And in one version of this story, they created Zenuum, the hummingbird, from a jade arrowhead. But in another, it's from leftover bits of feather and other parts of the various birds that they'd already created. And once they had finished their work creating the little hummingbird, they gifted it with extraordinary flight necessary to carry as messenger their thoughts and desires. And they cursed to death anyone who would try to capture the bird, which is why, so the story goes, no one has ever seen a hummingbird in a cage. Um, and I will say, I may come back to this, hummingbirds tend not to do well in captivity. So there, there is some truth to that. Zenuum, it appears, was female, feminine. Um, the gods liked her so much that they made her a partner, and then they declared the bird's wedding day, and all the other animals in the forest were invited, and this was exciting for the other animals, as it was the first wedding ever held. And all the other birds sang, and the spiders wove this ornate web path for the wedding procession. Everything was beautiful, except for the hummingbirds themselves, the bride and the groom. Remember, they were made from spare parts. So the hummingbird had a kind of light gray modeled appearance and looked pretty dull and disheveled as one might expect of birds made from leftovers. And seeing this, all the other birds offered some of their own most beautiful feathers to decorate the bride and groom for their wedding. And just like that, they were spectacular. And this is why hummingbirds are so varied and so colorful to this day. And the sun came out shortly after and declared them married. And the sun also promised that Zenuum's feathers would shine magically as long as the hummingbirds faced the sun. It's a really beautiful myth that we start with from the Maya. Um, and now I'm gonna share maybe a less beautiful but really interesting image of the hummingbird featured uh, in the mysterious Nazca lines in the deserts of Peru, um, believed to have been created sometime between 500 BCE and 500 CE. I'm not going to talk much about this one because there's really not much to talk about. We don't know a whole lot about who created these lines and why. There are many theories. Uh, but there's also just a lot of mystery here. Um, as you may know, the Nazca lines are lar large uh, ground-based features that can really be best appreciated from high above, uh, from a mountaintop or via an airplane, which is fascinating, or even satellite. We have more questions than, than answers here. 
Okay, and then we're going to flash forward now to the 14th century in central Mexico. Uh, or flashing back to a few minutes ago when I first mentioned them. So we're at the Aztecs now, for whom the chief deity was Huitzilopochtli. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. Um, his name literally meaning left-handed hummingbird or southern hummingbird. And he's usually depicted as he is here in this obviously modern graphic depiction as a multicolored figure with various features, including feathers and a needle-like beak. He seems like kind of a, a hodgepodge or a portmanteau of a bunch of other things. But the hummingbird is what he is named after, and the hummingbird is his main icon. And for the Aztecs, hummingbirds were courageous fighters, despite their size demonstrating tremendous strength and powers of flight. And moreover, the Aztecs professed a belief that hummingbirds never died or were perpetually reborn each day. And so they became potent symbols, we think, of the life force itself, uh, and as such important symbols in blood sacrifice. So Huitzilopochtli's origin myth then is fittingly violent. Um, his mother was a primordial goddess who became pregnant with him when she picked up a ball of hummingbird feathers that fell from the sky and then placed those feathers in her bosom. And her other children, <clears throat> including 400 sons, I have one and I find him completely unmanageable, but she had 400 sons who were themselves gods of the southern stars and also had a daughter who was a moon goddess. That's going to be an important detail. When they learned that their mother was pregnant again, um, they became really jealous of her soon to be born of their soon to be born sibling uh, and decided that they were going to kill him, basically kill him before he could be born, kill their mother before she could give birth if it came to that. And Witzlapashli spoke to his mother from within the womb and told her not to fear her children. And his reassurance proved itself because when his vengeful siblings arrived to murder their mother and him, Witzlapashli emerged from the womb, fully grown and wielding his signature weapon, the turquoise snake, which you can see in this image. And with that, he decapitated his sister and killed many of his brothers. So Witzlapashli, as the, the hummingbird, is, as in the Mayan legend, associated with the sun, here having killed his sister, associated with the moon. And as such, this legend is sometimes regarded as the triumph of day overnight. Now, although Huitzilopochtli defeated his siblings, the Aztec religion held that this struggle would continue anew every single day, and that the sun's victory over darkness was never assured. Therefore, to aid Huitzilopochtli in his continual battle against night, and therefore ensuring the continuation of the world itself, the Aztecs needed to provide him tribute in the form of constant nourishment. And so we come to our first dark corner. Um, this nourishment took the form of blood sacrifice from a human heart, which was one reason that the Aztecs uh, performed daily human sacrifice. So this image is from a, a codex from the, I think from the 16th century. Um, so the sacrificial victims, often prisoners of war, sometimes forced to dress as which Hishwapashli, excuse me, himself as a kind of tribute, would be taken up to the main temple in Tenochtitlan, and on top of the temple, the priests would cut out their hearts and hold them up to the sky, still beating, and you can see that depicted here. Uh, the victims' dead bodies would then be rather cruelly thrown down the steps of the temple, uh, and that's where they'd land on a stone carved with an image of the defeated moon goddess, which the Pashli's sister, and then cremation, or I hate to say it, sometimes ritual cannibalism would follow. Now, I should add that Huitzilopochtli was hardly the only Aztec god who warranted human sacrifice. And I should also say that animal sacrifice, including, we think, the sacrifice of hummingbirds, appears to have been a part of the Aztec ritual as well. Uh, there's some evidence, too, that Aztecs associated, associated hummingbirds with fallen warriors who were reborn in that form. So there, there's a lot more going on here, both in terms of sacrifice and in terms of hummingbirds in Aztec society. In wondering why Huitzilopochtli, this literally bloodthirsty god, would be associated with hummingbirds, I'd come back to that list of attributes that I mentioned before, not just the violence, but the sword or the needle-like beak, because in all probability that suggested to some early observers an instrument of bloodletting and penetration, 
and the bird's ferocity as well as its bright plumage. There was a perfect blend there of the beautiful and the sublime. Uh, and indeed, Aztecs sometimes wore hummingbird talismans, sometimes made from actual hummingbird parts, because they believed doing so would give them more potency, both on the battlefield and in the bedroom. Okay, this, uh, this is not Aztec, this is Olmec, so it's significantly older. I'm kind of moving around here a little bit. Uh, but it's a jade perforator, at least that's what we think. Uh, and so we would assume this was a bloodletting instrument based on a hummingbird's beak. So it gives you some idea of what I'm talking about here. Um, now I'm going to quickly survey just a, a handful from the many hundreds of post-Columbian Native American legends about hummingbirds. And I'm, I'm not going to show images for these. Uh, because the ones that I found tend to be pretty exoticized Western portrayals. Uh, and where I have found authentic Native American visual works, I don't know that it would be respectful for me to display them. So I should start by pointing out that for many tribes, there's an association between the hummingbird and tobacco. And I'm still trying to sort that out. I'm not quite sure I understand what that association is. Uh, so I'll bring up some maps here. Um, for the Mojave, the hummingbird is part of uh, a kind of creation or emergence legend. In primordial times, they believe people lived in an underground world of darkness, and they sent up a hummingbird to look for light, and its small size and its agile flight made it the best candidate for this task. And high above them, the little bird found this kind of twisted, contorted path leading to the sunlit upper world where we now live. So basically, the hummingbird and it was the pioneer that, that led us into the light, basically, into the world that we now inhabit from a kind of underworld. Uh, for the Taino people of Puerto Rico, they record a story of a young woman and a young man who are from rival tribes. And this kind of anticipates the conflict of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, which was, of course, written much later. Uh, they fell in love, bringing about much anger from their respective families and friends. And escaping this tension, one became a hummingbird and the other became a red flower, living in perpetual harmony and symbiosis. We have the Navajo. They have several hummingbird legends, actually. Uh, and in one, the hummingbird used to be as big as the crow. But when he broke the sacred rule not to feed on flowers, he was made small so that he could no longer harm the flowers that he fed on. And his song was taken from him, too. Other birds had pity on him, though, so they made him very colorful. Uh, in Cherokee culture, we find the story of a woman who was courted by both a hummingbird and a crane. She favored the hummingbird. I guess that makes sense. Uh, who was much better looking than the ungainly crane. But the crane convinced her to make things competitive. He asked for a race. He wanted to race the hummingbird around the world with the winner taking her hand in marriage as the prize. And she agreed to this, assuming the hummingbird would win since he was such a fast, agile flyer, unlike the bulky, cumbersome crane. Uh, but she failed to consider that the crane could fly all through the night, whereas the hummingbird fell into a deep sleep every evening. And sure enough, the crane won the race and her hand in marriage. But she ended up reneging on her promise, finding him simply too unattractive to marry. Sorry, crane. I should add that the Creek Indians have a similar story, but in their version, the crane wins because he flies in a straight line, whereas the hummingbird kind of zigs and zags. Um, probably unsurprising, given the abundance and diversity of hummingbirds in the Southwest, the Pueblo people have many representations of hummingbirds. And one story tells of a demon who was blinded after losing a bet with the sun. And in anger, the demon spews out hot lava, which ignites the earth in a great conflagration. And it's a hummingbird that saves the land by gathering rain clouds to douse the flames. The hummingbird's gorget, that colorful throat, that I think many of us would associate with hummingbirds, is a remnant of this act. It's meant to be a colorful feature attained when it had to fly through a rainbow to gather the clouds. And the hummingbird is often associated with rain in native legends. Okay, I want to pivot now um, away from First Nations and toward the era of European conquest, settlement, and its aftermath. What did the hummingbird become in the eyes of the Europeans and the Brits who had perhaps heard of but never actually seen them before? And how did they feature 
uh, back across the pond. And again, there's lots more here that I could say, so I had kind of a hard time selecting for this. Um, there's inconclusive evidence that Christopher Columbus was the first European to document seeing a hummingbird. And I say inconclusive, not because we don't have his brief note on that event, but because it's not clear if the small bird he described was indeed a hummingbird. There's some controversy about that. What we do know uh, is that a dried hummingbird skin had been sent to the Vatican by the early 16th century, and that Spanish explorers were regularly encountering hummingbirds by that time, having given them the provisional name of Payaro mosquito, the mosquito bird. Uh, some of these observers claim that it was actually an insect that had metamorphosed into a bird, uh, which is, I mean, in 16th century biology, kind of a rational conclusion to come to. Uh, others claimed, no doubt, influenced by the Aztec stories that they were hearing. Um, they assumed that hummingbirds died each year and were then reborn. So we see a lot of that in early European encounters, this interest in, in hummingbird regeneration. Um, over time, and in several languages, European and British ornithologists came to catalog and name many species, of course, and came to separate fact from, from fancy or speculation or superstition or misunderstanding, including the belief that hummingbirds might use their sword-like bills to poke a man's eye out. That was a really big fear. So we have explorers being quite deathly afraid of hummingbirds um, for fear of being blinded by them. I'll point out that it's probably around this time that humming, the hummingbird becomes a predominantly feminine signifier as, as we, I think, by and large voted it to be. For the British explorer of Barbados, Richard Legon, for example, writing in the 1650s, the pronoun she is the obvious choice for describing what he calls the strangest bird of all. Observing a hummingbird feeding on nectar, he writes, never sitting, but purring with her wings all the time, she stays with a flower, and the motion of her wings are as nimble and as swift as a bee. He then goes on to lament that he can't capture a hummingbird to take back home without killing it, and one has to wonder how many hummingbirds he killed before giving up on this idea. He says, we have no way to take her but by shooting sand out of a gun at her. But, and this, he says, stuns the bird, so that in his words, you may take her up, but there is no way to keep her alive, her feeding being such as none can give her food but herself. So there were many attempts, many attempts to transport hummingbirds back to Europe alive, but they generally failed, and none of the few that appear to have survived the journey lasted very long in captivity in, in Europe. But plenty of dead hummingbirds did make the voyage to adorn the wonder cabinets and displays of collectors. This only became more popular as the centuries wore on, but never more so than in the 18th and 19th century. So I believe this is an 18th century wonder cabinet display of hummingbirds. Uh, and no doubt, partly inspired by the popularization of Moctezuma's headdress, which had been very questionably, quote unquote, given to the Europeans and dubiously attributed to the Aztec emperor, hummingbird feathers and skins became increasingly hot commodities for European fashion designers. So Moctezuma's headdress features many feathers, including those of hummingbirds. Europeans made feathered hats the thing to have. And hummingbirds' feathers were so colorful, of course, and they were such delicate adornments that made them among the birds in highest demand. So to give some perspective here, just between 1870 and 1920, that 50-year period, England alone, just England, imported 40 million pounds of ornamental plumage. And think about how heavy a feather is, and now imagine what 40 million pounds of feathers means. Uh, so one feather dealer in London recorded a haul of 400,000 dead hummingbirds in a single year. Those are hard numbers to process. Um, if there is a, a silver lining to this, and a silver lining to the fact that several species of birds, including several species of hummingbirds, are thought to have been driven to extinction or endangerment because of the illicit feather trade, or this time I should say licit feather trade, legal. Uh, well, we're it, the Audubon Society, um, of course, because the formation of the Audubon Society was in part a direct response to the feather trade, an attempt to curtail or altogether stop it. Now, of course, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918 has helped a good deal. 
Uh, though, as a recent National Geographic article makes clear, illicit traffic in hummingbird feathers and even trafficking in whole hummingbirds is still happening, not least in the production of love charms. Uh, and this is an image of that uh, in some parts of Central America. So this is a, a painting, a self-portrait of Frida Kahlo from 1940, uh, where she depicts herself wearing a hummingbird necklace. Uh, I think to give Frida Kahlo credit, I think it's meant to convey a sense of tragedy here. I don't think it's meant to be a celebration of that use of hummingbirds. So all of this, the, the wonder cabinets, the hats, the necklaces, point to the hummingbird as a commodity, as a token of New World exoticism for which Europeans developed an appetite, and for rituals that have endured in spite of laws that are meant to protect the birds. Um, I'd be remiss not to mention more literal appetites, the hummingbird cake, popular in the American South. I will confess I had never heard of this until I started working on this, but I did finally get to have some hummingbird cake. It's quite delicious. Uh, don't worry, no actual hummingbirds are harmed in the production of this cake. They're not an ingredient. It's actually a banana pineapple spice cake. I don't know if anybody here has had them, but they're quite good. Um, often decorated with a cream cheese frosting and pecans. Uh, there is a connection to Jamaica with this uh, the hummingbird is the national bird in Jamaica, and it's the only solid explanation I found to justify the name hummingbird cake. I think that's where it comes from. It's Jamaican origin of this recipe. Uh, but to get past commodification and to back up a little bit, the hummingbird as a symbol takes on two radically different meanings in British and European history that I want to capture. One of them has to do with liberation and freedom. And the other is kind of a return to Aztec roots insofar as it has to do with violence. And that's kind of where I'm going to end up here tonight. So as a, a symbol of the unyielding search for sweetness and energy, and no doubt also because of its great freedom of flight, the hummingbird has sometimes taken on a kind of messianic purpose, standing for liberty itself. And as such, it inspired early abolitionist writers, including the 18th century British anti-slavery campaigner, Elizabeth Hayrick and her partner, Susanna Watts, who published their writings in a periodical that they called The Hummingbird, uh, which was an anti-slavery uh, tract that they wrote. And also an 1825 book that was called The Hummingbird or Morsels of Information on the Subject of Slavery. It's just a fascinating event in the cultural history of the hummingbird. Other examples abound, culminating far more recently with the bird's brief but powerful appearance as a kind of nagging presence in Nobel Prize winner and recently deceased uh, author Toni Morrison in her novel Beloved, urging the main character on in, in her dreams. Uh, so a symbol of freedom. Um, our second, though, and final dark turn is kind of the antithesis to that. So there's been much interest in hummingbird flight on the part of the military and aerospace industry, most recently with respect to drones, as featured in a 2013 war movie called Hummingbird. But it must also be noted that the first scientific attempt to analyze hummingbird flight is believed to have occurred in Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Two Reich-funded German ornithologists had secured a camera capable of recording 1,500 frames a second from a military research institute. And with it, they filmed two South American hummingbird species at the Berlin Zoo. And the regime, what they were doing with this was developing the first military helicopters. They wanted to know how these birds could hover so effectively on one spot, hoping to incorporate that in their engineering plans. Um, learn they did. And the world's first serially produced helicopter was born of their efforts. And they called it the Colibri, which is the German word for hummingbird. Um, as practical as their interest in hummingbird flight was, the Nazis also appear to have been interested in the bird's symbolic potential with its long sword-like beak. During the infamous so-called Night of the Long Knives, a deadly purge that took place in the summer of 1934, then Chancellor Adolf Hitler ordered a series of executions without due process, intended to consolidate his power and preempt an alleged or dreamt up coup against him. Uh, while it did subsequently become known as the Night of the Long Knives, in the moment it was referred to by the code name Hitler used, Colibri or Hummingbird, Operation Hummingbird. Now we can only speculate as to why, whether this was an arbitrary choice 
uh, maybe by design, a word that the conspirators would not otherwise mistakenly use, which I guess makes for a good code word. Uh, or if it was a deliberate one, again, perhaps a reference to the hummingbird's anatomy and reputation, anticipating the long knives of later fame. And in, in the article version of the talk, I spent a good deal of time on Operation Hummingbird. I even propose another theory for how it got its name, but I won't expound on that now. I'm happy to discuss after with anybody who's interested. Okay, so I need to draw to a close here. I'm trying to be mindful of, of time and I can't very well end with the stinking Nazis. Uh, so instead, I'm going to end with a meme that my 10 year old son picked. Uh, he said it was better than most of my own dad jokes, although I think he's wrong about that. Uh, that's kind of a low bar, though. So why does a hummingbird hum? Because it doesn't know the words. OK, I'll end with that and I'll stop sharing my screen. So thank you, guys. <laughs> Any questions or comments for Professor Powell? What a fabulous presentation. Yeah, it was just an amazing tour of, uh, of hummingbird history. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you guys for listening. And it's really fascinating, amazing, all that history. Thank you. And I really did have to, I left out far more than I included, but I can't, can't include it all. There's so much. It's a very rich history. So thank you. I look forward to your article. Say again where that when that'll be out and how we can find it. I, some of us tuned in a little late to get that info. Yeah, so I'm not exactly sure what the release date is. It's going to be there's a, a journal. It's it's an academic journal, but it's a fairly accessible one called Society and Animals that specializes in this kind of work on cultural history of wildlife. Uh, and so they are publishing it. They told me sometime in the early part of 2023. So hopefully in the next couple months. I'm just kind of dotting the I's and crossing the T's and waiting for them to do their part. So hopefully soon. And and yeah, when it is out, I'll, I'll be sure to forward that link to, to Jeff for anyone who's interested. Thanks so much. Thank you. So, so Noah, how many of the uh, North American hummingbirds do you have on your life list? Um, <clears throat> you know, I, off the top of my head, I want to say four. Wow, you got a bunch to go. Oh, yes, I do. Yeah, okay. no, I mean, like I said, on the East Coast, we only have the ruby throat. I mean, I have right. constant, you know, sightings of ruby throats. We get them in our backyard all the time. Uh, and living in California, un un I only became a birder about 10 years ago. So when I lived in California and I had access to the desert Southwest as well, I, at that point in time, I wasn't tracking. I'm sure I have way more <laughs> that I've seen, <laughs> but since counting, yeah, only probably only three or four. So, yeah, I love a Rufus hummingbird. Yeah. Good luck finding your owls. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, uh, somebody, somebody mentioned in the chat box mm -hmm. that perhaps a possible connection with tobacco, because you mentioned that. Yeah. Is the idea that um, you had mentioned before that hummingbirds are sometimes the messengers between, you know, the eternal and and the earthly, and that tobacco is sometimes used in that way as a you know a vehicle of prayer as well so that's a wonderful idea i really appreciate that and that that makes quite a bit of sense given the other mythologies that i i mentioned i haven't i haven't seen that association spelled out but it's far more probable than anything i've come up with so thank you yeah that's a great idea yeah I mean, of course, one thing I didn't really mention is the role of pollination, although that's, you know, obviously not something that was very well understood until the 19th century, really later. Um, but there's, yeah, there's many other kind of nooks and crannies to this history that are, are fascinating. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate the forum. Thank you. Thank you. It was a fun study. Yeah. yeah, thank you for for your work in in connecting some of the dots. We, you know, with birds, we tend to think in more terms of of scientific observation and hobby and things like that. 
and not so much the whole culture, cultural recognition of what these birds mean to human communities, those that they lived among uh, and those that discovered them for the first time and the influence that that has in, in, in mythology and all that. It's really fascinating. Thank you for sharing. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Is that it, people? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good program. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank no you. No one's finding you out.